Thanks for listening to this message from Fusion. You can find more messages at fusionbc.com. Uh, you know, I hear a lot of talk. You hear a lot of talk in church services about anointing. Some of it is spot on, some of it's great, some of it's very spiritual and wow sounding. But can I tell you that when you look at the Old Testament where the concept of anointing originated, anointing always happened for two purposes sacrifice and service. And the more I spend time in the ministry, the realize the more I realize it's the same thing. <laughs> Sacrifice and service. And that's really what God has called us to as His children, right? And so as we, as we enter into the Word of God this morning, and as we're believing God for anointing and believing God for the move of His Spirit, I want you to keep in your heart and your mind that the purpose of anointing is for sacrifice and for service. It's never for your glory. It's always for His. Amen. Um, the last couple of weeks I, I, I ministered, we, we talked about vision. By the way, I want to say a welcome to Anita Duick back from Japan for a few days. Thank you very much for being here. And we love the updates and everything that's going on. God bless you. Um, but I just want to say as, as we enter into to this today, I'm going to be talking about vision again. Um, but I want, to, I want to share with you as we get started that every... Every vision is tested, right? As soon as you decide or, or are determined or, or receive from God direction for your life, whether it's a, a long-term vision for ministry or for business or whether it's just a, a revelation on a better way to treat your wife or, or how to raise children in a, in a more godly home, any, any vision or direction you get from God, that's always going to be tested, scrutinized, and criticized. Because the enemy doesn't want you to fulfill the things that God lays on your heart. Either mentally you'll fight these battles, or sometimes by others. Often others, even in religious circles, will come and challenge and battle against the vision, the decision, the commitments that God has, has raised up in your heart. Therefore, we as believers must have commitment and dedication to see anything through that God lays on our hearts. We're easy as people, and I know you'll identify this even if you don't say amen. As people, it's very simple to, to feel like we received a direction or a vision from God, and we talk about it for a few days, and we might even plan a little bit, and then we get busy, and those things fall to the wayside. And if we're not careful, we completely lose the heart of it, and then one day down the road, we look back and we think, you know, God had kind of wanted me to do that one time, and I never, I never made it happen. Anybody? ever had those things five honest people in the building okay that's all right that's why we're a church we're here to get you saved um, <laughs> we must have the strength to resist the attacks that's meant to thwart the things God lays on our heart to keep us from filling and doing all of the the, the dreams and the vision that God gives us and if an enemy can can destroy or stop you from the vision that God has laid on your heart. He has simply rendered you ineffective in the kingdom. There must be the mentality of warfare in the heart of every believer. Because if you don't want to fight, it doesn't mean the enemy won't show up to fight. If you're not going to fight for the things that God has laid up on your heart, you, I promise you the enemy will fight to keep it from happening. So the believer must have the warfare mentality. An understanding that God has commanded us as his children to occupy until he comes. Therefore, there's a battle to be fought and I'm going to fight it. Whether it's the battle for my heart and mind, whether it's the battle to accomplish the vision and goals God gives me, or whether it's the battle for the souls. Remember when, and I want you to turn to Acts chapter 26 and then I'll be with there in just a second. But I want you to remember that, that when, when they come to the coast of Caesarea Philippi and Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said some, some Elias or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. There is something speaking to your heart other than just the voice of men. 
There is the, the Holy Spirit of God that is leading, ministering, touching, pouring out, trying to bring you into a place of faith and glory. That, 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 that voice of God ministering to you is bringing the revelation of God forward. He said, upon this rock, Jesus said, the rock of the revelation of the Holy Spirit, of who God is, of what God wants to do in you. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. There is a battle that is going on in the kingdom to bring what the enemy has tried to claim as his own forth into the kingdom of God, to bring the lost, to bring the hurting, to bring the the unsaved into the kingdom of God. The enemy has them surrounded. He has them uh, 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 brainwashed by by all of the culture of our day, from from television, radio, books, uh, 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 the conversations and things that go on at work. All of these things are the, the, the gates of hell trying to surround and keep the lost lost. But God said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church because we bring the light of truth and hope and the glory of Jesus Christ and the truth of God will shine in any darkness and bring truth and reality. And when they recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he loves them and forgives them, they can receive the glorious light of salvation as well. But there has to be a body of people who will storm the gates. There has to be a body of people who will stand for truth. There has to be a body of people who will declare the glory of who our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. Amen. Acts 26, verse 12, we we come to, this is really the the defense of of Paul as he's taken before the king and made, uh, he's been accused, of course, and now, now he has to, he's questioned and he has to make defense. In verse 12, he says, whereupon... As I went to Damascus with authority and commissions from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and inheritance amongst them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to the small and the great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning does make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, But speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, but for whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. Father, we thank you for the revelation that is brought forth by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the insight and direction that causes us to walk day by day in your truth, in your glory, in your will. 
being empowered by your Holy Spirit to make a difference in the world around us. So not only are we changed, but those that we bring into contact with the fellowship of your spirit by fellowship, through prayer, and through the ministering of your word, God. We release you, Holy Spirit, to do the work you intend this morning, to lift up those that are downcast, to bring revelation and light to those that are in darkness, to bring healing and comfort to those that hurt and those that mourn. In the mighty name of Jesus, we declare our God is able. Amen and amen. I, I, I know that that's a little bit of a long text. I don't normally read that long, but, but I just wanted to present it and then we'll break into it and kind of tear it apart and, 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 and look at some of what God is saying there. But I, I want you to understand that that heavenly vision, Paul said, he received from God. And as we talk the first couple of weeks of the year, uh, there, all of us should be receiving direction and insight from that Holy Spirit. Direction for our lives, direction for ministry, insight in things that were going on. Amen. How many knows the Lord still speaks to us today? Amen. He ministers to us through his word. He ministers to us through fellowship. And, and, and we should be expecting and experiencing that as believers. But I want you to understand this morning that just receiving something from God is simply the first step because then you have to be faithful to that thing. You have to make sacrifices. You have to make commitments. I think as, a, as, as a, any pastor would, would testify, it's funny how when you, when, you, when you run a church and all of the things that go on, how many people want to enjoy and take part, but how few people are actually willing to make the sacrifices it takes to pull it off. In the States, they often refer to as the 80-20 rule. 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. 20% of the people are given 80% of the money. 20% of the people are committed enough to get it done. The other 80% just get to come and receive and talk about what a great church they go to. And that's a great place to be when you're born again, but that's not where God intends you to stay. Can I get a big amen? amen. God is leading every servant of Christ into greater servitude as we walk with him. He said, to whom more is given, more is required, right? Right? And you have to learn to be faithful to that heavenly vision, even when it takes sacrifice, even when it takes effort, even when it doesn't come easy, even when it looks challenged and it doesn't seem like it's going to come to pass, even when the enemy attacks and you just don't understand how in the world can this be happening when God has said this was what was going to happen. But in thy patience, possess ye your soul. Because in those times of trial and testing, when we learn to just hunker down and believe and trust and cling to Jesus Christ, then we stay in that place of, of, of holiness and righteousness as God begins to move. And like Jericho, the ground opens up and the walls are swallowed and the obstacles that seem to keep us from fulfilling that vision and goal, it isn't our responsibility to remove them. It's just our responsibility to be faithful. It's God's responsibility to remove the obstacles and bring victory. You realize Paul's greatest persecution didn't come from the world. It, it came from the religious circle he was from. Ironically, Jesus' greatest persecution didn't come from the world either. It came from the very people he came to save. Hello? Why would you tell us that, Pastor? Because I want you to understand something. The enemy will use anything to attack you, including those around you. In fact, the closer he can get to you with the people he attacks you with, the more chance he has that you'll quit. Some people quit church because somebody said something about them at church, as if everybody in church was perfect. Can I tell you as a pastor, I know for a fact everybody in church ain't perfect. I can tell you for sure that the person sitting beside you has problems. And I can tell you for sure the person sitting beside them has problems too. Amen. And yet, we, we go to our homes and we go to our families and we're surprised when there's an attack. We go to church and we're surprised when they're attacked. We go with friends and we're surprised when we're attacked. That's why the Bible says it's not a battle of flesh and blood. 
It's not about whether or not your family was correct or the church member was correct or, 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 or your wife or your husband was correct. Listen, the point is everyone around you is an opportunity for you to be offended and hurt if you'll allow the enemy to offend and hurt you. That's why believers have to make the decision. I'm not going to be offended. I'm not going to be hurt. I'm not going to let you distract me from the vision and the goals that God has given me as a believer, as a child of God. And I'm going to keep my vision and my focus squarely and centered on the Lord because I know the enemy wants to hang me up. He wants to trip me. He wants to deter me. And I'm going to fight the fight of faith that says, this is the vision and direction God has given me. This is the church God has given me. This is the wife God has given me. These are the children God has given me. And I'm going to be dedicated, committed, and, 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 and a rock through the power of Jesus Christ not to be deterred, not to be distracted, not to be run off. I am rooted and grounded in the vision, the purpose, and the call of God, and nothing can stop me. That has to become the heart of every believer. Because as soon as it's not, the enemy comes in and pushes you aside. He gets you offended. He gets you wrapped up in other things. He gets you all caught up in emotional things and, and hurtful things. And, and, and pretty soon, you're, you're, you're so distracted that you've completely lost the vision of the commitment you had to the purpose that God brought you there in the first place. I've, I've done marriage counseling. I, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of times I've done marital counseling with people. And can I tell you, it's, it's always generally the same story. These two people met. They fell in love. They had this glorious picture of what marriage and life was going to be together. And then they woke up next to that person. And their breath smelled bad in the morning. And... He left his underwear in the bathroom floor, and she knows he doesn't like spaghetti, but she made it anyway. And pretty soon, all of the little things that you can take offensively robs you from the very purpose you got married for. And then you found out when you got married, there was other things you had to do to accomplish that. Well, I didn't know when we got married, I had to wash the dishes too. And so now we're upset about this isn't what I wanted because I, listen, isn't washing dishes worth having that marriage that you pictured having when you first decided to get married? That was a really, really good opportunity for every man to score a point right there. Really, there should have been a bunch of amens right, right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> she has a husband that loves her and takes care of her and provides for her, and she has to pick his underwear up once in a while. I didn't know he was going to have to pick up his underwear. Yeah, well, he'll learn. My, my point is, there's more to the job than you thought. But the added work doesn't distract from what you're working towards. And if you're not careful, and I'm just using marriage because it's obvious and easy, right? When, when, I, when, I, when I got into ministry, the concepts that I thought it was to be a pastor was nothing like reality. That's the reason why we don't take people who have never done anything and make them the head pastor first. You first go through some other positions in learning because you couldn't pull it off otherwise. Because there's some things that you go through and put up with and do. Somebody told me just this morning, they said, you know you're fighting a losing battle. And I said, oh well. You see, you're still people no matter how hard I try. So it's always a losing battle. If you think your objective is to get people to be perfect. But when you discover that your objective is not to get people to be perfect. But to love people who are called by a perfect God. To be a witness and a light to those who are in need. To be a friend and a comfort to those who are struggling. When you learn what your job really is, it actually becomes a lot easier. Can I tell you, husbands and wives... Take it from somebody who's done hours and hours and hours of counseling. You're making it harder than it is. Because the things you're focusing on aren't the jobs that you're really called to. You're not supposed to fix him where he never leaves his underwear laying somewhere. 
You might have a great husband that doesn't do that. And if that's not his problem, I promise you there is a problem. And you've complained about it to your friends. And that's okay. But when you become focused on what God has really called you to, and you get that bigger picture mentality, then the little things of picking up and throwing away, you know, we, we, we provide coffee because we want everybody to enjoy their service. And, you know, not, not, you know some people don't have time for coffee. I mean, we don't start till 930, but <clears throat> some people don't have time for coffee. So we, we put coffee in the back because we want you to enjoy it. And then every week we go through and we pick up all the coffee cups that you're not able to pick up your own coffee cups. And I could get really aggravated by that, and I could get frustrated, and I could get up here, and I could rail every week. But really, I don't. I, I mean, I want you to pick up your coffee cup, but if you don't, I'll pick it up. Because it's worth having you here in his presence where his spirit speaks to you. And you might get a revelation, and you might get a touch, and you might get changed, and you might be on fire for God, and you might be called to ministry, and you might make a difference in the lives of others. And all of that leads right back to, I picked up your coffee cup. And that's all right. Amen? And you, you lose the big picture, the vision, the direction of God because we get so distracted and so tested and all these little petty little things. I've seen people get so upset because God gives them a vision and a direction or some type of ministry or, or maybe just something to do for church and, and they, 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 they show up and they start telling everybody and nobody comes and nobody wants to get apart and nobody else catches the vision and then they're mad and they quit church and they never go back to church again all because nobody would help them do what God called them to do. I, I can't tell you the thousands of things I've done on my own. Can I tell you that God will call you to do things that nobody else will get the vision for and you'll go and do it on your own, but you won't be alone because when you do what God calls you to do, He will be there with you. And if God is with you, what does it matter who else shows up? Oh, well, I would have wanted support. Then you should have been praying because God will give you all the support you need. Hello? Hello? Yes, it's great when other people show up and help. Absolutely. But if you're going to need everybody else to show up for you to begin to work for the Lord and do the things that God lays on your heart and instructs you to do, you're never going to be accomplishing what God called you to do because all of those other things are just distractions. The vision is God called me to do this. And I'm going to be faithful to that heavenly vision. I'm going to be committed enough to do what I'm called to do if nobody else goes. Paul said, when no one stood with me, the Lord stood with me. What is a greater uh, comfort or help or strength than knowing that God is there with you? In 1 John chapter 3, and verse 14, he says, We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. He sacrificed for me, and that revealed his love. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Anointing comes for service and sacrifice. You don't get to be anointed to be something big. That's just what happens after you have served and sacrificed. Amen? Any glory that comes forth, any honor that issues forth, it always comes as an effect of the service and the sacrifice. And here's the, the problem of men, is we want the glory and the honor, but we want to find a way to get it without the sacrifice and the service. So we want titles, but we don't want to serve. We want attention, but we don't want sacrifice. Can I challenge that for just a second? The reason why we're that way is because our focus is on the title, it's on the attention, it's on the glory. God's vision will never be about that. The vision of God will always be about the service and the sacrifice. Jesus didn't come to stand up as king and kings. Jesus come to be slaughtered for the world. His vision was a cross. 
But because of the cross, he's now king of kings and Lord of lords. Can you say amen? So if we're going to walk in honor and we're going to walk in glory and we're going to walk in power, there must first come the vision and direction of God that leads us to that place of service and sacrifice. They say that the worst reason to start a business is money. The number one most successful reason for starting a business is because you see a need in your community. When they, when they poll, when they study successful businesses compared to failed businesses, best reason to start a business is because there's a need in your community that's not being met. That's the service. That's the sacrifice. The end result? Success and money, which we all want that. But Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Even Jesus is saying, it, the focus has to be the service and the sacrifice. If you'll do that, if you'll be focused on meeting the needs of others, then we're sowing the seeds that bring forth the harvest. Amen? Am I preaching to anybody this morning? You're all quiet. Do I need to bring the praise worship back up? He says, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I was reading a, I was reading a Facebook message this morning. Some, some guys had been on there, I don't remember exactly when it was, because at my age, um, it doesn't matter if it was one day or four days, it was just the other day. And I saw they were wanting to help a, 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 an elderly widowed woman by putting a bathroom on her house, and they were asking for people to donate or, or, or to come and, and, and help, and, and there was a whole bunch of comments about, oh, well, I'll donate some, or I'll give this, or I'll give that, or I'll give this. And then today I saw them repost it, and they said, you know, it's really sad how many people said they would come and help and donate, and how few people actually showed up, and how little bit of donation actually come in. Did you know that I would probably make 100,000 U.S. dollars a year just in donations if everybody in America that told me they were going to sponsor my ministry would sponsor my ministry? I am unsupported from the U.S. God does it all from right here. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. But it reveals the nature of people. It's easy to say, I'll help until it's time to help. It's easy to say, I love you in church, but are you, are, are you visiting that person when they're hurting, when they're sick, when they're going through a trial? It's easy to say we're brothers until that person has a, a failing or a mistake or an accusation. Then we find out who family really is. Can I get an amen? Because then everybody abandons them. I, I refuse to be that kind of believer. If you're my friend, you're my friend. And when you fail, I'll look you in the face and you say, you failed, but I'll put my arm around you and we will walk together as we overcome the failure. If somebody gossips about you, I will tell them I don't do that. If somebody comes to me to spread stuff about you, I not only won't listen to them, but I'm certainly not going to repeat it. I mean, like 90% of all gossip is lies anyway. The point is, there has to be a decision on our part. What kind of believer are we going to be? What is our vision of a godly man or woman? What is our heart as a believer? Rather than doing it in word, there should be something in our heart, in our spirit, in our soul that looks at the, the life of the believer, the witness, the example, and it says, I'm not going to lose the vision God has given me to be a believer. I'm going to stand for righteousness. My, I'm going to let my character line up with who God is and let people see Christ in me. Can I tell you that so, there's times when the rest of the church might not understand you. All the other believers might not get it. I don't know how many times I've been on the other end of all the other pastors because they, not these pastors, but I mean in a, in a, in a pastoral group because I didn't see things the way they saw it or I didn't do things the way they did it. Can I tell you it's okay to be different? If you're different, it just means that God called you to do something they're not doing. If you were just like them, you could go do all the things that they're doing, but God doesn't need you to do what they're doing. They're doing it. God needs you to be you. And in the glorious you that God created you to be, he can accomplish something new that's not being done anywhere else. It's okay to be you as long as you are centered in Christ. But the problem is that most, most people have tied their own agenda to God. If it's not their agenda, then it isn't God. If you're not doing their agenda, you're not doing God's work. Hello? 
If you're not doing it the way I think you ought to do it, you're against God. That, that's literally the way so many people present their beliefs. So many people present their agendas. Can I tell you that that's wrong? Can we say that? Can we just say it? It's wrong. It's wrong to believe just because they're not doing it your way, they're against God or they're not God's. That's not true. Not everybody preaches the same. Not everybody's called to the same. I've heard, I've heard ministers crucify other ministers because their prayer group didn't do things a certain way or their, their teaching style didn't do it this way. Or they, you don't have to shout to be holy. And you don't have to be quiet to be holy either. Amen? I just want to free you right now from the expectations of other believers. In the name of Jesus, I set you free by the liberty of Jesus Christ from the expectations of everybody else. You don't have to do everything they think you ought to do. What you have to do is receive a vision from God of how He wants you to do it and be committed to that vision. Can I tell you that part of the time Paul was on the outs? When he first, when he had his Damascus experience, he did not immediately go to the apostles and be welcomed in by him and sent off by him to do exactly what they wanted him to do. You're supposed to be different. You're going to be different. Every church is going to be different. We as a body of believers have to come to the place where we recognize that that body of believers over there and that body of believers over there, they don't have to do it like fusion does it. That's okay. They have to be faithful to their vision, and we have to be faithful to ours. I mean, you realize that people are so shallow that if you don't like the same flavor drink they like, you don't count. I've heard, literally heard people say things like this. I'll just use this as an example. Somebody say something like, well, you know, dark roast coffee is just the burnt leftover beans. Which the implication of that is if you like burnt coffee, you, you don't really know anything about coffee and you, you, you're just not qualified to drink coffee now. You see how shallow that is? The sad part about it is we take that shallow mentality and we try to apply it to ministry. We try to apply it to marriages and family. We try to apply it to, to Christian living. We try to, we try to apply it to preaching styles. Everybody's got their own favorite flavor. I like Dr. Pepper, and if you don't like it, I don't care. When I go buy drinks, you tell me what you want, I'll buy the kind you want. I don't care. You don't become less than holy because you don't like Dr. Pepper. But when we get to heaven and the fountains all shoot out Dr. Pepper, remember what I said. People get so attached to their own opinion that they disqualify everybody else if you don't agree with my opinion. Can I just give you a very spiritual, shut up, right? If our eyes are on Jesus and the love of God is flowing through us, then my heart would be to buy you whatever flavor you want. I don't care if you want to ruin your coffee with a double-double cream and sugar, go ahead. I'll mix it for you if that helps. Let me get back to the text. <laughs> the church has a job. Say amen. amen. The church has a job. We see it in Ephesians 4. We'll get to it in a second. And I believe that every person who decides to attend and become a part of a church, you should line up with the vision of that church, and you should be making yourself available to bring forth the vision of that church. If you don't like that idea, let me present to you something you're not committed to that church. It's okay. Every church has people who just attends. I would never tell somebody they can't come back because they just attend. If you want to just attend, you just attend. But you're not going to get out of the church what those who, that 20% of committed, dedicated, sacrificing people are. If you go to a job and you just attend your job. You might get a paycheck at the end of the week, but you ain't getting no raises and you sure ain't getting no promotions. That's good English right there. But it gets the point across. For anything to grow, for anything to develop, for anything to become valuable, there has to be sacrifice 
and service. Amen? I know I'm running out of time, but I'm trying to hurry. In Ephesians 4, we see verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. That's what he gave. This is why he gave it. This is the purpose of the church. Are you ready? For the perfecting of the saints. How many need to be perfected? Right? For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. That's the building up as a framework. That's the structure, the teaching, the development, the growth. Till we all come into unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, that means mature, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The job of the church is so that all of us receiving ministry and teaching and development grow to a place of maturity where we're walking in that fullness of the stature of Christ. Fully developed into mature adult men and women, sons and daughters of God, making a difference in the community, leading others to Christ, discipling and mentoring others, being like Christ. That's the job of the church. Now, we can get distracted with a lot of things. We can do a lot of programs. We can get distracted by what other churches are doing. We can get distracted by what our church isn't doing and other churches are doing. We can complain and grumble because the air conditioner isn't working right. We can complain and grumble because the pastor teaches too long. We can complain and grumble because the worship team didn't sing our song. But none of that changes the true focus of the church. Bringing all of us in unity to fellowship with God and fully functioning as mature believers in Christ. Accomplishing the will, the plan, and the purpose of God. Not only as a church, but in our own lives. Amen? So somebody turn the air conditioner up a little bit. It's hot. And let's keep going. (laughs) Verse 16 says, For whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by the which every joint supplieth. Every joint is supplying something to the body of Christ according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. Listen, make increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So we're all supposed to be taking part in this fellowship and our fellowship with one another is supposed to cause one another to grow and to develop and to love each other so that we're built up stronger together. Everybody smile at me real big. It doesn't say anything in here about having a sanguine personality or a caloric personality. It doesn't say anything in here about being an introvert or an extrovert. It doesn't say anything in here about being a people person or not being a people person, liking crowds or not liking a crowd. Because all of those things become distractions from the purpose. Now the truth is, you might be sanguine or you might be caloric, you might be an introvert and you might be an extrovert, but all of that is still usable in the house of God. If your heart is content to be used, you will be used. If your heart is content to use your excuses not to have to be used, then you won't be used. It's the purpose, the vision of the heart. Are you going to be used or are you not? I want to challenge you with a couple of very practical things real quick, okay? And then I'm going to try to close. I'm not done, but we're going to close today. Can I give you a couple of really practical things just as examples? These are not the full list of anything. Can I do that? You okay? Can I have five more minutes? I'm going to take it anyway. You might as well be in agreement. One of the things I love about our church is when when the service is over and we're done, sometimes 45 minutes to an hour after church, people are still here fellowshipping, loving on one another, encouraging. That to me is a very good spiritual sign, right? That means God is moving. People are growing together. There's a lot of love. That's a very good sign for a church. Let me tell you the other side of that. There is a lot of you that as soon as we say amen, you get out that door as fast as you get out that door. Now, I don't want to shame you. I don't want to make you feel bad. This isn't about that. Here's my point. What can God do with you if you give it a minute before you leave? Who could you talk to? Who could you share with? Who, who, who could find connection with you 
if you didn't leave as soon as the church was over? Very practical, very simple step. Give it a few minutes. Shake a couple of hands, say hello to someone. You don't like a crowd? That's fine. Find a little empty corner. Let somebody come to you. It's okay. I, don't, I, I, don't, I want to stretch you a little bit, but I don't want to kill you. Amen? I want to stretch you, but I don't want to break you. Everybody in here eats. I don't see anybody skinny enough that we know you don't eat. If you did, it wouldn't last long. I obviously eat. Find somebody in church to connect with and have a meal with somebody. Hello? You don't have to be fancy. I'm not asking you to take somebody out somewhere fancy. I'm not asking you to spend a bunch of money. If if you want to have fellowship with somebody and you can't afford it, you call me. I'll bring you some hot dogs. Because it's really not about the meal. It's about the opportunity to get to know one another and to fellowship a little bit, to be a part of that body. If God has called us as believers in the body to edify one another, to encourage one another, to be here for one another and strengthen one another, there has to be a fellowship for that to happen. We try about once a month to do some kind of something here on a, on a Sunday evening or something just to give everybody that opportunity, but don't limit it to that, right? You will find that your gifts and your calling and the vision of God will be birthed in the midst of taking action. Nobody sits at home in a prayer closet until vision falls on them. All of us should have a prayer closet, and all of us should have time in that prayer closet. Uh, prayer closet is a metaphor for your time spent alone with God. I don't need texts later asking me what type of closet you should build. We need to have time in prayer, yes. But ministry happens during interaction, during fellowship. You might find yourself praying for people and that praying for people might open up into an intercessory gift or you might pray for somebody and they get healed and all of a sudden you discover that you have a gift of healing in, 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 your, in your calling. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The, fo- the point is all of those things develop out of those first steps. In order to learn to play basketball, you have to learn how to run, you have to learn how to dribble, and you have to learn how to shoot. You don't have to learn how to jump. I'm proof you can play basketball without jumping. But you can't learn to play basketball until you learn to do the basics. You can't learn to be a functioning Christian until you learn the basics of Christian fellowship. Loving on one another, praying for one another, visiting with one another, sharing with one another. If you're not comfortable with that, understand something. It doesn't matter. Jesus wasn't comfortable on the cross. I get up every week and some of the things I tell you, I'm not comfortable telling you. I just have to. Amen? You are going to spend your time on something you will either consume your time in trying to 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 chase after comforts you'll spend your time trying to chase after pleasure you'll spend your time trying to chase after desires or you'll spend your time chasing after god and i want to challenge you if you'll spend your time chasing after god all that other stuff will get fulfilled all on its own amen After 23 years in ministry, I can tell you the greatest gift God has given me is the fellowship of my friends and believing friends, my family that believes God, my my church family that believes God, the close-knit people that God gives me that we fellowship with, minister to, share with. They are there for us, we're there for them. Those are some of the greatest gifts I have received in the kingdom of God. And some of you, if you were honest, would say, I don't have that. And I challenge you, one of the reasons why you may not have that is because you may not be chasing that. Amen? Thanks for listening to this message from Fusion. You can find more messages at fusionbc.com.